I think we can uh, start. So, good morning. Uh, welcome to the fourth lecture already of uh, this series of five lectures. Um, so, in the first lecture, I gave a bit of an overview of uncertainty in computational geometry. In the second one, we saw how to compute bounds on measures. In the third, third one, I talked about this preprocessing paradigm. Now, I want to go back to the bounds on measures, but now in a probabilistic setting. So, uh, so far, I've only said uncertainty regions are regions where we know there is a point, but we didn't assume anything about probability distributions. Uh, but of course, um, uncertainty is uh, very much related to uh, probability theory and statistics. So uh, today we'll take a, a more probabilistic um, point of view to uncertainty and see what we can do uh, in such a case. Okay. Well, I have a pointer. Yeah, I, I just tested it before the lecture and it worked. And of course, now it doesn't anymore. No? Okay, I will use this pointer. Maybe. I will continue with this one uh, for now. Oh, it's working. <laughs> what did you do? Yeah. You pressed the magic button? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Just this one and this one. Yeah, I know. That's what I tried. No, maybe with okay. the other hand. Okay. Ah, uh, right. maybe, maybe, yes. <laughs> it's sensitive to, uh, to that. Okay. Sorry for this uh, uh, little technical um, intermezzo. Um, so, just to recap, uh, this is the slide from the first presentation, uh, just to bring you on, on the same page. Uh, probability and independence is one aspect of uh, uncertainty. Um, maybe we don't just want to say, I have an uncertain point with some possible set of locations, but maybe I want to assign probabilities to those locations. So, for example, I may have a point which has two possible locations, each with probability one half. Um, or maybe the probabilities are different, or maybe you have more points. As long as these probabilities sum to one, it's a, a valid random variable. Um, I may have a continuous distribution of my uncertainty. Um, I may have a uniform distribution that's uh, defined on a region. Um, I may have more than one point, like n points. Uh, and again, they may be discrete um, and certain points like here. So I've changed my, uh, my points to uh, have little different shapes because I think it was maybe not so visible uh, which color the points had before. Uh, so hopefully this works better. Um, and again, uh, so the question of course is are these probabilities independent and probably they are not in most applications. Uh, <laughs> but if we have to model this uh, dependence, things get much harder. So for today, I'm just going to assume all my random variables are always independent, okay? Um, all right, so the first uh, question is, if we're dealing with these um, probability distributions, maybe the most natural setting is that we have a continuous distribution, like a Gaussian distribution. Um, for example, if I measure my point with GPS, then uh, I get some location and Probably the point is close to it, but maybe it's further away, and, and a reasonable model for this is a, a continuous um, probability distribution. However, these things are very hard to calculate with, so the first thing I'm going to do is approximate my continuous distributions by discrete distributions, okay? So how can we do this? Well, there's a very uh, useful concept for this, which is called uh, quantization, epsilon quantization, and I first talk about the one-dimensional uh, version of this to uh, get uh, the concept across. So suppose we have an uncertain point in one dimensional space and we have some continuous probability distribution on this uh, point. So we have our space, it's a line, and we have some distribution that says, well, for every point of the line, uh, there's some uh, likeliness that the, the point is actually there, but it's a continuous distribution. 
So we have this function and the area under the function has to equal one, right? We, we know this from uh, basic uh, probability theory. Um, so how do we approximate such a thing by a point set? It's a bit hard to uh, formalize because points are discrete, so uh, the probability of any point uh, being the real point here in this continuous case is of course zero. So how can we still do a useful approximation? Well, we can do it by looking at the uh, cumulative version of the distribution. So if I look at uh, the cumulative distribution function, then uh, this is the, uh, the integral, the, uh, so the value of this green function is the integral of the yellow function up to this x uh, coordinate. And this green function is some xy monotone function that's zero in uh, minus infinity and one in plus infinity. And uh, this one is much uh, easier to approximate or at least more insightful. So we can approximate this green function by some sort of uh, step function like this. So here I'm making a function with steps of height epsilon um, or, or rather I'm making sure that the height between the green function and the red function is always at most epsilon, so I actually have steps of height to epsilon. And uh, now this step function we can project back down to uh, the line like this, and now I have a point set. And this point set is called the, uh, the epsilon quantization of this uh, distribution, and we can say things like um, any region that contains a certain number of points has uh, a probability within uh, an epsilon error of the probability that uh, the region contains a point in the continuous case. So it's a, it's a useful way to approximate this continuous distribution. And this concept of uh, epsilon quantization, we can also generalize to uh, higher dimensions. So in two dimensions, it looks something like this. Uh, we have two-dimensional space, so I have uh, x and y axis here, but I'm uh, drawing a three-dimensional picture, so it's projected version. Uh, so, we have, so we have some two-dimensional probability distribution. It's some surface that lives in three-dimensional space. And we can again take a cumulative uh, version of this. Now it's cumulative in two dimensions. Uh, for this we can uh, build some approximation and now we uh, uh, project down um, the uh, sum of the points of this approximation. So, so the way you have to interpret this is um, any, for any point in two-dimensional space, the height of this step function is the number of points that's contained in uh, the quarter plane that's uh, centered at such a point. So for example, you have these, uh, uh, I guess it's the quarter plane this direction. So here I have a vertex on my step function which is defined by these two points because if I I'm here, then the quarter plane contains two points. If I go down this step, then it's because I contain just one point. And on this side, I also contain one point, and here it contains zero points, okay? So that's just how you have to interpret this uh, uh, step function. And again, it's defined by a set of points in the plane. And we wanted to approximate oh, this function by being within height epsilon difference everywhere. And again, this is possible and this point set is now the two-dimensional epsilon quantization of our uh, distribution. Okay, so this is useful and, and we can use these for many applications, not for all of them. So at the end I will uh, say that there are some applications where this doesn't work, like visibility. Um, but for many applications uh, it does work. For example, when you want to compute some basic measure like the diameter or, or the width of the, or of the point set, then we can use such a quantization as an approximation of a continuous distribution. Okay, is this uh, clear? Because for now I'm going to forget about anything continuous and just talk about discrete distributions. All right, okay. So, output distributions. Suppose we have uh, a measure on, on that takes a, computes a value on a set of points in the plane, like before. Okay, mu is some function, it takes a point set, it produces a real number. And before we said, well, 
if the points are uncertain, then we can compute an interval of possible values. But if we actually have uh, uh, a probability distribution for every point, then we can do more. We can actually compute the probability distribution of this whole measure, right? So P is a set of probabilistic points, so uncertain points with a probability distribution. Um, then mu of P also has a probability distribution. We can just see it as a random variable. Um, okay, so if each point has uh, k possible locations, then there are k to the n possible uh, point sets, and each of them has a certain probability of being the real answer. So this gives us a, a probability distribution over the output value. Okay, question is, uh, well, this is of course an exponential number. Um, can we still do something in polynomial time? Can we compute this distribution, describe it, approximate it? What can we do if we only want to spend polynomial time? Okay. And the answer is it really depends on the measure and it's not so obvious at first sight when this is possible and when this is not possible. So I'm going to talk about two different measures and in one case I'm going to show you that you can compute this distribution and describe it in polynomial time. And in the other case, it's NP-hard. The two measures are smallest enclosing circle and diameter. Okay, so two measures that look very similar at first sight. Um, smallest enclosing circle is one I haven't talked about uh, before yet, so I'll just quickly define it. Um, if we're given a set of points P, so this is a precise set of points in the plane, then the smallest enclosing circle is uh, the, sma the smallest circle that encloses the points. Okay, it's a pretty clear definition, I think. Okay, we take a circle around the points and we shrink it until it cannot be shrunk further. Um, so it's a measure somehow of the extent of the point set. And we can make some observations about it. So one of them is uh, the concept of a basis. So I say the basis of my smallest enclosing circle is the set of points that actually lie on the smallest enclosing circle. Okay, so you can see there are three points that um, define the smallest enclosing circle, or, or equivalently, the basis is the uh, smallest subset of my points which has the same smallest enclosing circle as the whole point set. Okay, if I take just these three points, I compute the smallest enclosing circle of them, then I get the same circle as for the whole point set. Okay, so this is what I call the basis of this measure. And uh, we can observe that the smallest enclosing circle always has a basis of either two or three points. Or one point if my set is only one point, but that's maybe a, a <coughs> not such an interesting case. If my point, has, point set has at least two points, then it's always two or three points. Okay, so in this case it's three, and uh, here in this case it consists of two points, and these are the only possible cases. Okay, so now let's look at smallest enclosing circle in the uh, uncertain case. So I have again a set of points, now they are probabilistic points, and I want to compute the distribution of possible values of the smallest enclosing circle. Okay, so here's my point set, I have uh, three uh, blue points, three yellow points, and three red points. Um, what is the, no, what are the possible smallest enclosing circles? Um, well, obviously, um, a basis consists of at most three points. So if I have n points, then I have to choose three of them to form my basis. So that gives n to the third possible uh, probabilistic points that define the basis. And then each of these points has k possible locations, so I get k to the, k to the three uh, possible instances of those three probabilistic points. So in total I get n to the three times k to the three possible uh, bases. Uh, for example, here is one, I could have this smallest enclosing circle, uh, or here's one, I could have these three points, or uh, I could have these two points, um, or these two points, and um, so there's only n to the three times k to the three possible bases, but of course there are k to the n possible point sets, so there must be multiple point sets that have the same basis. 
And this makes sense. So for example, if I take the basis consisting of this blue point and this red point, then there are three different uh, sets which have this basis, namely this set. If I take this set of three points, then my basis is this blue point and this uh, red point. But this set also has the same basis. Okay, it also has this blue and this red point. And this set also has the same basis. So there are multiple uh, sets with the same basis. Okay, kind of obvious. Um, so now, if we just count the number of supports of each basis, then we get our probability distribution, right? We have a set of n to the third, k to the third possible basis. Uh, we count how many uh, supports they all have, and uh, we draw some sort of figure here. So here I have my possible values d of the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the size of my smallest enclosing circle. And for each value, I, uh, well, for each basis, I have a different value of d. And I count how many actual point sets support this basis. And that's the number of steps I go up in this function. So. Uh, the smallest distance here that corresponds to this uh, smallest circle here. Um, but I have only one uh, support for this basis, so I only go up by one step in this function. And then I have another one with one and some other small steps here. And there's also some steps where we go up by more than one because there are multiple supports for such a basis. So I, I can draw this function. And this is exactly the cumulative uh, probability distribution of my measure. Uh, if I scale this down so that 27 becomes one, so I divide by uh, k to the n. Okay, so this is the thing that we want to compute. And we can already see here that the complexity of this function is not too bad. It's only, uh, there are only n to the third, k to the third different values of d where I change the uh, probability. So the complexity of this step function is at most uh, n to the 3, k to the 3. So it's not exponential. But then still, of course, we have the question how to compute it. Um, and it turns out that we can compute it fairly easily. So how do we count the number of supports for one basis? Well, just look at uh, uh, the basis and look at the numbers of points inside the circle and multiply them. Okay, so maybe I have a situation like this. So I have four and certain points, each of them has four possible values. I have a basis that consists of two of these points, and I want to know how many supports there are for this basis. Well, we can see for the red point, uh, if the point set has to have this basis, then I have to pick this red point. I don't have any choice. Uh, for the yellow point, I should pick either this point or this point, because if I pick one outside the circle, then it won't have this basis. And for the green point, I can pick this or this or this point, but not this one. And for the blue point, I have to pick this point because it's actually on the basis. Okay, so I have these possible choices for my points. One choice for red, two for yellow, three for green, one for blue. One times two times three times one equals six. So I have six possible supports for this uh, basis. Okay. So it's just a matter of counting the number of points inside the circle. And then if we do this uh, cleverly while we are uh, summing over all possible uh, bases, then uh, we can actually compute this in just uh, linear uh, overhead per basis. So the distribution has complexity nk to the third, and we can compute it in nk to the fourth time. So this is polynomial. Okay. Any questions about this uh, part? Okay, so then let's move on to another measure which on first sight looks very similar to the smallest enclosing circle, uh, the diameter. So the smallest enclosing circle is a way to measure the size of a point set and the diameter is a way to measure the size of a point set. Um, and the definition is kind of similar maybe, it looks close to it. Uh, so. For a diameter, the uh, definition is just take a set of points and try all the distances between two points and pick the largest one. So this is the diameter of this point set. Um, and now we wanted to compute the distribution of 
possible values of this diameter. So we can just try to take the same approach, right? So uh, the basis of a diameter is the set of points that define the diameter. But since the diameter is defined as the distance between two points, obviously the basis consists of those two points. Okay, it's fairly clear. Um, so only two points, which means there's only n k. Uh, well, so this is uh, uh, for the exact case. So now if we go to the probabilistic points, can we just do the same thing? Well, we look at this probabilistic point set. Um, the basis is defined somehow by uh, two points of different colors. Um, so there's uh, uh, nk squared possible uh, values. So the step function again will have uh, polynomial complexity. But now if we try to count the number of supports of one basis, we run into some problem. Um, so support, suppose I want to look at this basis and I want to count how many point sets have these two points that define their diameter. Okay, so we can try to, to do the same thing and say, well, I can look at least at this shape. So if any point lies outside this loon shape, then it will be further than this distance from at least one of the points, right? If, if a point is here, then it's too far from this blue point. If a point is out here, then it's too far from this red point. So anything out there we cannot use. Uh, but anything inside this loon could be in a point set that has this uh, diameter. However, not every combination of points inside this loon shape has this diameter, and that's a, a problem. Okay, so um, I can look at the, the set of points which could contribute to uh, a set which has this basis. Um, and so I see for green, I could choose this point or this point, but not this one. For yellow, I can pick this one or this one, but not this one, and blue and red of course, they are defined because they define the basis. Um, but now if I look at every possible combination of a yellow and a green point, then I see for this set here, uh, I'm okay. So for this set of four points, this is indeed the diameter. And for this set, I'm also okay. So for this set of four points, this is the diameter. And for this set, also, this is the diameter. However, for this set, uh, this is the diameter. So if I would just multiply those numbers, I would be overcounting. I would be counting uh, some point set which actually has a different diameter, and that messes up my uh, distribution. So I cannot just do the same counting approach. And um, it turns out that this exact problem here of counting how many uh, supports there are, are for a given basis is what makes the problem hard. So we cannot just multiply the numbers of uh, uh, points to count the supports of one basis. And in fact, it turns out that counting the number of supports of a basis is sharp p hard. Do we all, does everybody know what sharp p hard is? Yes, yes, okay. So it's like mp hard, but maybe even harder. Um, so, why is this uh, sharp p hard? Well, let's do a, a, a little hardness proof again. Um, diameter, we're going to uh, make a reduction, and the problem I'm going to reduce from is uh, this sharp two set. Um, so this problem is counting the number of uh, variable assignments which satisfy a given two set formula. So two set formula is a set formula where every uh, clause has exactly two literals. But I'm going to reduce from a special version, which we call uh, sharp 2L2 set. So it's uh, two sets, but now every literal appears in at most two clauses. Okay, so not every variable, but every literal. So if I have a variable x, then x can appear in exactly two clauses, or, or one. And not x can also appear in two clauses, but not in more than two, okay? And so uh, we get some set of clauses like this. So here uh, I have x1 or not x2 and not x1 or x3. And we can see x1 appears here and uh, nowhere else. And not x1 appears here and here. 
Um, so it's at most twice, and you can verify for every uh, literal that it appears at most twice. And uh, I am going to, cl going to claim that this is still a sharp P hard problem. Uh, the proof is not so hard. You just, uh, if you don't have this um, situation, you can introduce some dummy variables to, uh, to make it have this form. Um, I'm not going to go through those details. Just assume that this is sharp P hard and now reduce diameter um, uh, uh, from uh, this problem. Okay. So one observation we can make about uh, an instance of uh, uh, 2L, 2 set is if I look at the graph which has one vertex for every possible literal and an edge for every clause, so I have a, a clause, an edge between x1 and not x2 because there's a clause that has both of them. Um, so I can draw this, uh, this graph. So here are all my literals. I have x1 and not x1, x2 and not x2. And I just draw in these edges for the clauses that were on the previous slide. Okay, so if, uh, if this is my class x1 or not x2, and uh, well, for every class I have one edge. Then the observation is that the graph that I just drew is a path or a set of paths. Okay, why is this? Well, uh, since every literal appears in at most two classes, it has at most two edges, uh, and a graph in which every ed uh, every um, vertex at degree at most two is a path or a cycle, actually. So it could also be there could be cycles here. Um, okay, so I have this uh, uh, graph which is a set of uh, uh, paths or cycles, and um, now I want to make a, an instance of um, my probabilistic diameter counting problem uh, which solves this instance. Okay, so for this, uh, the idea is that we can uh, embed this graph. So for every vertex, I'm going to pick a point in the plane, so it's like a graph drawing problem, um, in such a way that if there's an edge between my two points, their distance is greater than d. And if there's not an edge between uh, my two points, the distance is smaller than d. Okay, so this means that um, if I uh, want to solve my, uh, uh, my diameter counting problem, I'm looking for assignments of truth to the variables such that uh, for every edge, only one of those two uh, Clauses, uh, literals appears in my uh, uh, point set, which corresponds exactly to not uh, choosing this point. Okay, so uh, one way to do it is to draw this big circle. Um, so I spread out a set of points on the circle such that this distance is just larger than d, and all of these other distances are smaller than d. And um, so I have my uh, class here between x1 and not x2. So if I pick x1 uh, uh, in my point set, then uh, I cannot also pick not x2 in my point set um, if I want to uh, have a point set of diameter less than d. Um, so you may think, well, that's not exactly what a clause is. Uh, that's true, but it's actually the, the inverse of a class. So in other words, uh, if I re now reverse the truth values of all my literals, then it says that I have to either make x1 false or uh, x2 true to um, satisfy this constraint, constraint that these two points are not at distance d from each other. Okay? Is that... Uh, uh, idea sort of clear. So uh, each variable, uh, x1 up to x5, corresponds to exactly one probabilistic point with two possible locations. And um, well, this construction shows that um, if I want to count the number of uh, possible point sets which have a diameter smaller than any given number d, then this counting problem is uh, 
sharp p-hard. So in, in, in particular, if I want to draw my cumulative uh, distribution function and I want to know the height of this function at any given point, computing this height is sharp p-hard. So I cannot efficiently compute this uh, distribution function, even though it has only polynomial complexity. Any questions about uh, this part? Okay, if not, then um, let's continue with the next topic. Um, okay, so we've seen that there's two, uh, two measures which are somehow very similar intuitively, largest enclosing circle and diameter. And in one case, we can efficiently compute this uh, probability distribution. And in the other case, it's hard. Um, so it's somehow a very strange uh, property of this, uh, this kind of analysis, maybe. Um, but you may wonder, OK, if, this, uh, uh, if such a problem is hard, can we still do something else that's useful? Um, can we still compute some aspect of this probability distribution that's uh, interesting, or maybe some other uh, way to interpret this uncertain point set that uh, uh, gives some useful information? And for this, I want to define the concept of uh, shape inclusion probabilities. Okay, so a shape inclusion probability um, is the following. So again, consider a set of probabilistic points in the discrete model. So we have, uh, or not in the discrete model. Uh, so in, in general, we can define this for any uh, uh, distributions. So these are supposed to be Gaussian distributions, right? So they, are, they have this bright spot in the middle, which has a higher probability, and then they smooth out towards infinity. So I have a set of uh, these uncertain points. And um, now I'm not just interested in uh, some value on this set of points, but actually uh, in a location as well. So suppose, again, I go back to the smallest enclosing circle. OK, we know we can compute the distribution in polynomial time. But uh, maybe I want to know not just the size of the smallest enclosing circle, but I want to know where the smallest enclosing circle is. OK, so of course, there's an infinite number of possible smallest enclosing circles in, uh, in this continuous case. Uh, so how can we visualize this output distribution of circles? OK, so for this, we can define uh, the shape inclusion probability, um, called the SIP. That should be a P. It's not a probability. Um, OK, so we want to compute this uh, uh, shape in inclusion probability of all points. So what is it? Uh, the shape inclusion probability of a point in the plane is the probability that this point lies inside my shape. So if my shape is a smallest enclosing circle, then uh, in this particular case, all the points inside this uh, contour line here have a 90% chance of being inside my smallest enclosing circle. And the points uh, here have a 10% chance, or at least 10% chance of being inside my smallest enclosing circle. Okay, so this, these contour lines are um, contour lines of a three-dimensional function, which assigns to every point in the plane the probability of that point being inside my shape. Okay, and that's what, I, what we call the shape inclusion probability. Um, so now let's go back to the discrete case and see if we can compute this. So the, uh, the, the SIP of the SEC, shape inclusion, shape inclusion probability of the smallest enclosing circle, didn't fit on my slide, so I have to use abbreviations. Um, not even if I rotate a little bit. Uh, so now consider a discrete uh, probabilistic set of endpoints with k possible locations, like before. What is now uh, the uh, shape inclusion probability of any point in the plane? Okay, can we describe this exactly? Well, turns out we can. So we can consider the arrangement of all the possible circles, so the, all the possible bases of the smallest enclosing circle. 
Uh, so we get this arrangement here, right? So this might be the smallest enclosing circle of these three points. Uh, this circle might be the smallest enclosing one if uh, these three points are there. And so for every every possible basis defines one of these circles and I just draw all of them on top of each other. And this divides the plane into these cells. Okay, so there's uh, only uh, k times n to the sixth cells, right? There's uh, k times n to the third possible basis and they all intersect each other in a, t in a constant number of points. So the complexity of this arrangement is kn to the sixth. So in this small example here where I have three points that each have three possible locations, I get nine to the sixth. So it's, it's less than a million cells, so it's a small constant. Um, and we can uh, just um, compute this uh, arrangement exactly. And now for every cell in the arrangement, assign the shape inclusion probability. So in every cell, uh, the shape inclusion probability is constant. No matter where I am in this cell, there's always the same set of circles that I'm contained in. We can count the supports for all of these circles, and this gives us the probability for this cell. Okay, so we can just compute this for all the cells, and then we have an exact representation of the shape inclusion probability of the whole plane. Um, but maybe I want actually a picture like I had on the previous slide where I just chose some contour lines because maybe this whole arrangement is too much information. Uh, so I can draw some contour lines in these arrangements of circles. So maybe I want the contour line where I am in at least three circles. So I can trace out like the three level from the outside in this arrangement. And this gives me a contour line. And this is exactly what we did on this previous slide. So this picture here uh, that you see, it looks a little bit wobbly and that's because this actually is a contour line in an arrangement of circles of an approximation of these continuous um, distributions. And of course, the, uh, the smaller you choose epsilon, the more smooth these contour lines will look. Okay. So this is something we can compute exactly in polynomial time for the smallest enclosing circle, but well, that's maybe not so strange because for the smallest enclosing circle, we could also compute the uh, output distribution exactly in polynomial time. Um, but what about things for which we cannot compute the output uh, probability? Well, it turns out that um, in some cases, we can still compute this, uh, distribution of shape inclusion probabilities exactly. So the example I want to give is uh, convex hulls. So convex hull is another uh, uh, shape or defined on a set of points. And if we want to do an output distribution on convex hulls, then we run into some uh, problem again. Um, if I want to do an output distribution on the convex hull of a set of probabilistic points, so I have my point set here, uh, four points, which each have three locations. And I want to compute the convex hull. Well, then a basis of the convex hull actually can consist of n points, because I might just have n points which lie in convex position, and all of them are on the basis. So I have actually uh, k to the n possible basis which means I can have k to the n different values of, uh, say, the area of the convex hull. So if I want to compute a distribution of the area of my convex hull, then it just has uh, exponential complexity. So in the case of diameter, it had polynomial complexity, but it was hard to compute. In the case of convex hull, the complexity is even already exponential. So there's really nothing we can do, right? We can have all of these different convex hulls. There's just exponential number of them. Uh, there's nothing we can do, okay? And actually, even if we just want some specific uh, values in this probability distribution, like you can say, okay, well, this distribution may have exponential complexity, but can we at least compute the basis which has the highest likelihood of being the real convex hull? So which convex hull uh, is most likely? Which one has the, the largest number of supports? This is actually already NP-hard, as was proven by Suri et al. So maybe this is not very visible, but this is Suri et al. 2013. 
uh, so it's fairly recent. Um, there's really nothing we can do about this output distribution of convex holes if we want to have exact algorithms. However, it turns out the shape inclusion probability of the convex hole can be computed in polynomial time. So somehow it's a more informative measure and it's also easier to compute. So for the, the SIP of the convex hole, um, we want to subdivide the plane into regions where the shape inclusion probability is constant. And it turns out that for this, we need to take this uh, arrangement of all possible uh, um, bases. And even though the number of bases is exponential, this arrangement only has polynomial complexity. So we can just take uh, the arrangement of all the lines defined by all pairs of points of different colors, okay? So that's gonna look something like this. Like this, okay. Uh, so it's a, a pretty uh, uh, dense looking arrangement, but still uh, it only has um, uh, nk to the fourth cells because there's only nk squared lines. Um, and now we can see that if I draw any kind of convex hole between uh, points of four different colors, it's gonna be somewhere in this arrangement, which means that uh, inside any cell in this arrangement, the shape inclusion probability is constant, okay? And still there's a question, of course, how can I compute this probability within one of these cells? And it turns out that this is also possible in uh, polynomial time, in fact, you can do this in uh, n, log I, n log n time for a given uh, cell after you do some pre-processing. And this is a very recent result from 2015 by uh, Agarwal et al. Um, so it turns out that you can compute these probabilities efficiently uh, and therefore you can again compute this whole uh, distribution of shape inclusion probabilities and maybe extract contour lines if you want in polynomial time. So even though for looking at the distribution of uh, possible values of some measure of the convex hole, there's really nothing you can do. You can still compute these shape inclusion probabilities efficiently. Okay, any questions about uh, this part? Yes. Uh, your problem doesn't depend on the distribution. Uh, it doesn't depend on distribution. Yes, yes, so, so it's, it's, it's uh, working for uh, um, uh, discrete uh, uh, probability distribution, but it is not necessary that the probabilities of each point are equal. We can have any assignment of probabilities to uh, those points, yes, if that's what you mean. One of the problems is true. Sorry? One of the problems uh, has the same manner. Yes, so for any set of probabilities, you can do the same thing. It's just that uh, instead of counting points, then you have to uh, take the weights of the points into account as well, but this is, this is no problem. It all works. Any other question about shape inclusion probability? Yes. Um, you add movement as in you want to uh, locally update the situation? Sorry? <laughs> so uh, uh, if you've computed this, uh, this arrangement, say, and you, and you move one point a little bit, yeah. then uh, uh, there will be some changes, of course, in the arrangement, but only in the lines that involve this point. And if the, the movement is somehow local, then the number of cells that are going to change will be, I think, only quadratic and it's, uh, instead of uh, n to the fourth. So I think in, in quadratic time, you, you should be able to uh, update this. Um, maybe if you don't need to actually update the actual shapes of the cells, but you just want to keep this combinatorial situation, you can do it faster. But then you get uh, some sort of kinetic data structure problem where you need to know what is the next uh, cell that's going to collapse in this arrangement if I move one point. Okay, 
any other questions about uh, this part? Then I uh, want to briefly also talk about, uh, uh, so, so far, um, I've only talked about this discrete uh, probability distributions, and I said, well, if you have a continuous one, you can approximate it by a discrete point set using this uh, epsilon quantization. Um, but this doesn't work in every possible application. Um, so I just want to briefly talk about visibility problems between probabilistic points. And uh, we'll see here that if we use a point set to uh, approximate a continuous distribution in a visibility problem, this may not give any guarantee on the uh, approximation ratio or the quality of the computed result. And so we have to do something else. Okay, so why is this? Well, consider this very simple problem. So I just have two probabilistic points. So I don't have a whole set, I only have two of them. So here are my two probabilistic points with nice, smooth Gaussian distributions. And I just want to know the probability that these two points can see each other, that they're visible from each other. Okay, it's kind of a simple problem maybe, the probability is just one, so let's make it a little more interesting and add some uh, obstacles. So we have a set of n obstacles, the ob obstacles are maybe convex polygons uh, in the plane. And now again I want to know the probability that this uh, green point can see this purple point uh, and they're not blocked by one of these obstacles. Okay, now suddenly it's not so easy anymore. The probability is not one, it's something between zero and one. Um, and how can we uh, efficiently um, compute it? So one first idea you might have is, well, we have these continuous uh, distributions. We know that we can uh, approximate them by point sets. So let's just uh, uh, compute some epsilon quantization of this point uh, distribution and one of this and just uh, count how many of these pairs of points can see each other and it gives us an approximation of the probability of visibility, right? So let's try. Um, what's the probability that they can see each other? Let's uh, put some set of points here on the, the left. So this set of five points, say, is uh, some epsilon quantization of this uh, left. Uh, uncertain point and this set of five points is an epsilon quantization of this right uncertain point and I try uh, to see if some pair of points can see each other well for these two yes they can just see each other so uh, so that's fine I look at some other pair uh, these two also can just see each other and I just uh, try this for all pairs and it turns out well for every pair of points uh, there's a line that just misses all of these obstacles and they can all see each other so my conclusion is uh, the probability that these two points can see each other is one. Okay, so this uh, intuitively doesn't really make sense because there's all these obstacles, so there must be some uh, possible locations of the point where they cannot see each other. But if I chose my, uh, if I was unlucky in my choice of a quantization, uh, even though this set of points uh, approximates this distribution within some error of epsilon, I still cannot guarantee that I uh, capture the, the situation correctly because I don't know in advance where my obstacles are going to be. And it could just be that they happen to be in such a place that I don't block any of this finite set of uh, visibility arrays that's defined by this finite, two finite sets of points. Um, but maybe for the same set of obstacles, I had chosen a different uh, quantization on the left and the right, like this one. Maybe it's also a valid epsilon quantization. Uh, and now I try to see which pairs of points can see each other, and I try some point, and well, these two points cannot see each other because there's some obstacle in between. And these two points, uh, it turns out they also cannot see each other because there's some obstacles in between. And maybe I try all pairs of points, and there's only three pairs that can see each other. So these two can see each other, these two can see each other, and these two can see each other, but any other pair cannot see each other. So I say, well, I have five points on the left and five on the right, so I have 25 possible uh, pairs, only three of them are, can see each other, so the probability that these two points can see each other is uh, three over 25. Okay, uh, so it's a kind of different number than one, which we computed before, 
so you can see that the, the answer to this question really depends on where my points happen to be or, or maybe where my obstacles happen to be. And since I don't know this uh, um, in advance, there is not really anything useful we can do with such a, a point approximation. Okay, so we have to come up with some different strategy to solve this kind of problem. Um, and it turns out that what we can do is if we have a smooth uh, probability distribution, uh, say a Gaussian, instead of approximated by approximating it by a set of points, we can uh, approximate it by a set of regions where we assume that on every region we have a uniform probability distribution. And this uh, makes the problem a little bit uh, uh, easier than computing directly on uh, the Gaussian distributions. It's of course harder than computing on points, but um, it's somewhere in between and it turns out that uh, for regions we don't have this uh, problem that uh, we might miss the obstacles, and they're still simple enough that we can do some reasonably efficient computations. Okay, so how do we compute, uh, how do we approximate a set of, uh, uh, how do we compute a, uh, how do we approximate a probabilistic point by a set of regions? Um, well, the idea is kind of similar to that of uh, the quantizations, except that now I'm not computing points, but regions. So again, I have some uh, distribution, and I'm first going to approximate it by a set of concentric disks. Okay, so I have some uh, distribution here. I can have some, I compute some step function. Um, this time I'm going to use steps of different heights. I'm going to, uh, uh, balance the areas between these uh, regions here, or actually not the areas in this two-dimensional picture, but the volumes in the rings that these form in a three-dimensional picture. Uh, so these uh, volumes will be all equal. Um, and then I'm going to further approximate these rings by polygons. Okay, so I have a set of concentric rings, and now I, go, now I draw some polygons in between those rings. Um, and then in the end, I get a picture that looks something like this. So I have my two-dimensional Gaussian smooth distribution, and I approximated it by the set of polygons, which are somehow stacked on top of each other, and they form this three-dimensional step function. So it's like this layered cake of uh, polygonal uh, shapes. And uh, I want to minimize the, the, uh, the area that in between those two shapes. So I don't want the area that's in this uh, cake but outside of the yellow mountain to be too large. And I also don't want the area that's inside the mountain but outside the cake to be too large. Um, so I want to minimize this total area, but I also want to minimize the complexity of my cakes. Um, and you have to somehow balance these two and the mathematics behind this is uh, a bit more complicated than uh, if I just want to use a point set. But it turns out that I can still uh, approximate such a Gaussian distribution uh, within uh, error epsilon by uh, using a set of uh, order one over epsilon polygons where each polygon has a complexity of order one over square root of epsilon, okay? So there's some, some function of epsilon that gives us the complexity of the approximation. Um, so it's no longer just complexity one over epsilon as it was in the uh, case of point sets. Okay, so now um, I have this set of regions. So, so one of these polygons now is a region and uh, uh, the probability distribution on this region is uniform uh, with uh, uh, the height of the region as the value of the distribution. Okay, so this means that for a point in the center I, my probability will be the sum of these two individual probabilities. Um, and with this, if we go back to our uh, visibility problem, now I have two regions in my set of uh, obstacles. And now I can actually guarantee that if I uh, correctly compute the probability that a point in this region can see a 
the point in this region, then I get an actual epsilon approximation of the probability that the original points can see each other. Um, question, of course, is then how do we compute whether uh, two such points can see each other? And for this, we have to uh, uh, do some uh, 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 complicated uh, computational geometry. So we can do this in n squared times m squared time. And I didn't put in the uh, slides that show this construction, um, mainly because uh, it was already 2 a.m. and I didn't feel like making more slides, but also because maybe I thought I wouldn't have enough time to go through them anyway. Um, so sorry, there will not be any details. Um, but uh, uh, we can do this in n squared, m squared time, and if you're interested in how to do it, uh, uh, we wrote a paper which has all the details. Um, and then if I apply this back to the uh, original result, um, we arrive at, uh, so the final result here is given two Gaussian distributions and a set of uh, obstacles in the plane, we can approximate the probability that two points can see each other within uh, an additive error of epsilon in time uh, one over epsilon to the third plus n squared over epsilon squared. So this is just combining this claim with the quality of the uh, approximation that we saw before. But really the, uh, the takeaway point uh, for this last part, I think, is that uh, point sets are not always sufficient to uh, uh, approximate distributions. In some cases, uh, you have to resort to regions, and, and, but for regions, you can still obtain uh, results. Yes? What is M? M. Um, so one of them is the complexity of the regions, and the other is the complexity of the obstacles. But I forget which one is which. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because it's n squared, m squared. OK. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, complexity of the, uh, the region times the complexity of the obstacles squared. Any other questions? So I think I, this is the end. Yeah, so it's my final question slide anyway, so thank you. Are there any questions about any of uh, uh, today's talk? If not, then I think we can have a break and then uh, I have another talk for you after the break. <laughs>